Okay, so today we're talking about confirmation bias, and this is in terms of the TED Talk video that is in your additional reading in Google Classroom. Be sure that you watch that video before you do this, or before you look through this PowerPoint. Okay, so after you've watched the video, um, we're touching on the largest concept from the TED Talk video, which is confirmation bias. And if this sounds familiar, it's because we learned it in first semester comp where this is a barrier to critical thinking along with anger and ignorance. So this is one of the traits that can often stop you from being open-minded and fully understanding an argument entirely. So what is confirmation bias? So if you look at the words by themselves, it pretty well explains itself. So bias is one-sided. This is the stance that we have built, um, the one side of the argument that we're leaning towards. And then confirmation of that is when we are only seeking evidence to support that one-sided argument that we have. So rather than looking at all these opinions and suspending our opinion or belief, we are focusing on our stance entirely and only looking to build evidence to support that rather than looking at what other theories are and how they have used evidence to support it. So this is one of the most important features behind the article analysis that we're doing each week is that you whenever you look at these arguments, you're not look you're not looking to agree or disagree with it. You're looking at, did the person give a good argument or a bad argument? Were there effective elements or ineffective arguments or elements? So the, what needs to happen when we're looking at data is we need to be asking ourselves the question, does the data support the theory? Does the evidence that we use support the theory that we are making? But oftentimes, because of confirmation bias, we simply say, does the data correlate with the theory? This is what we want to avoid, all right? So the reason behind this, and we learned this as one of our fallacies last semester, is because correlation does not always equal causation. Just because the evidence correlates doesn't mean that it, that it supports, all right? So, so, you know, once again on this next point, consistency does not always mean the data supports the theory. Why? Because the data can be consistent with rival theories. All right. And what ha and what rival theories are is where they use the same data to build a different theory. Okay. So this is where we get into that conversation of that data is objective and theory is subjective. We talked about this in our analyzing arguments lecture last week, where you have to understand that facts are facts. So those are objective. Facts can be used on all sides of arguments, right? And then the theories and the opinions and the stances built around those facts, that's subjective. So while the facts are not debatable, those are facts, those are set, the theories built on those facts are the debatable fact, or sorry, the debatable element. Okay? So... Um, what this looks like, and we use this example in class, was that say that, um, let's say that Jim has a family with a cancer history, okay, and they all also drink alcohol. So Steve is a doctor, and Dr. Steve says, has evidence, proven evidence, that alcohol alcoholism, excessive alcohol drinking can lead to cancel, cancer. Well, that is true because Jim only looks at that theory and not the rival theories. He therefore concludes that all of his family has cancer because they have drank alcohol in their life. They've drank too much alcohol. But some of the missing elements that he's, or some of the missing rival theories that he's missing is Dr. Eleanor says um, she has evidence to build that the environment in which they live is producing chemicals that is causing cancer. And then Dr. Allison has evidence towards her argument that smoking cigarettes causes cancer. So if Jim only looks at Dr. Steve's argument that alcohol causes cancer, then he's not considering the rival theories that maybe it's the environment that his family is living in or the fact that they are smoking cigarettes regularly that's causing the cancer. So even though there is evidence behind alcohol causing cancer, 
by only looking at the fact that alcohol causes cancer and not looking at the rival theories, Jim has just committed confirmation bias. Because even though the data correlates with his theory, even though the data correlates with his theory, it doesn't necessarily support the theory because there are outlining factors. So the data is all correct in each one of these doctors' theories, um, which doesn't discredit them. But it does mean that Jim needs to look at the whole story rather than just focusing on Dr. Steve's argument that, that alcohol causes cancer. So... Um, and this is where Edmund says, but due to confirmation bias, we never consider the rival theories because we're so protective of our own theory. We're so, so what this means is that we're so eager to be right that we're only looking at the evidence that supports what we believe. We're so eager to be able to prove someone wrong that, or just find substantial belief or evidence that we are correct, that we don't look at other people's opinions. We don't look at the entire well-rounded argument. So he mentions this a little bit in his video, Bayesian Inference, and I'm not going to go into too much detail with this simply because um, this is a huge mathematical statistical concept and it's pretty complicated. But what I would just basically want you to understand from this is, does data support the theory? Don't get, don't get so hung up on the idea of, is data consistent with the theory? Because data can be consistent with rival theories. So instead you need to be looking at data on all factors, on all levels, through all rival theories, and then determining does data support the theory. Because if other rival theories can use the exact same data to support their theory, then it doesn't mean that you're correct. The big idea behind this is that checking the facts is not, not enough. So when you're building an argument and you're building evidence, a simple fact um, and, and knowing that your facts are correct doesn't mean that your theory is right. So you see this all the time in people's arguments. If you check their facts and their evidence, it doesn't mean that it's incorrect, but maybe their theory on the interpretation of this is wrong. So, or it just hasn't, or there's other theories that we need to consider. So a perfect example of this is looking back to last semester when we did our literary analysis essays. So... I can pull a quote from a book and I can say, this is how I interpret it. This is what I think this character is doing. This is what I think they mean. But someone else can pull the exact same quote and interpret it a different way based off of other context in the book. So checking the facts is not enough because facts can be used to support very, very different theories. So you need to be looking at not only facts, but all the theories as well. The other understanding that we need to have is that one example is not enough. So... He uses this in his video when he talks about how people say, well, you have to have an education to become a millionaire. And then someone says, well, what about the Kardashians? So there's always going to be an exception to the rule. There's always going to be those small stories. But what Edmonds is saying is that we need to be able to focus on all of the stories. <coughs> not just the 1%. And he uses this quote, we share the outlier cases because they are new and therefore they are news. We never share the ordinary cases because they're too ordinary. They're what normally happens. And that's the true 90 and that's the true 99% that we ignore. Just like in society, you can't just listen to the 1%, the outliers and ignore the 99%, the ordinary. So, um last or so one of my students had a perfect example of this, and that is someone says, well, cigarettes won't cause, me, won't cause me to get sick and die or get cancer because my dad smoked cigarettes forever and lived to be 90 years old. He's the one story. What that person is ignoring is all the other stories of people who smoked their entire lives and ended up with the diseases. That's the ordinary. She's trying to use the one statistic um, the one story that makes the exception to the rule to build her entire case. So we commit confirmation bias when we accept that a story is fact. All right? We commit confirmation bias when we accept that a fact is representative of all the data. And we commit, con or we commit confirmation bias when we accept that the data that we have is all the evidence we need to build the theory. Because that data can be the same evidence that another theory is using. 
So this is where we get to anecdotal and empirical evidence. So anecdotal is where you use stories. Empirical is where it's been taken through a scientific process. All right. So anecdotal is the story of the person who says, well, my dad smoked cigarettes and lived to be 90 years old. So that is true. So that's a true story. It happened. But that doesn't mean that it is enough evidence and support to build a theory around. It's only anecdotal. It's a story. Empirical is where you say, well, this one person smoked cigarettes their entire life and lived to be 98 years old. The empirical evidence is that 80%, and this is made up, but 80% of people who smoke end up with cancerous disease. That's the empirical evidence. So how do we find truth? We have to understand that a story is not fact. That's the anecdotal evidence. The story may not be true. It may not be entirely representative. A fact is not representative of all the data, and we have to understand that. Data is not entirely supported, is not enough evidence always to support a theory. And our evidence isn't always enough because other theories might be using it to argue their case. So what's the big message here? Is that you have to be open-minded. You have to un constantly be willing to step back, suspend your belief and your opinion, and look at the whole argument. Here's some terminology to know. Um, so be the Bayesian inference, we already kind of explained. Um, I'm not going to expect you to know a whole lot more, a whole lot about that. The only thing I really want you to understand is the question. Does the data support the theory? Confirmation bias. This is where we seek information that only supports our theory, our bias. Post-truth means that we're more willing to accept the, the unusual, the story, the small percentage rather than the whole story. We're more willing to be drawn by emotion and personal belief in shaping our opinion of the world than we are scientific evidence. Groupthink is what happens when we're not willing to um, step away from the group as a whole and think independently. This is where we allow other people to think for ourselves. Devil's advocate means that we need to constantly be putting our opinion on trial. All right. So we need to constantly be shaking the foundation of our structure, of our of our beliefs and of our theories and saying, is this really true compared to, you know, when I look at all the rival theories, does my opinion still stand up or do I just hold on to this opinion and confirmation bias because I want to be right? So um, this is where we get into, um, you know, what are some tips that Edmonds gives us in discovering truth? So first, actively seek other viewpoints and be ready to be proven wrong. Suspend your belief. This is where you're willing to step back and stop being willing, so willing to reply and be more willing to understand. Okay? The second point of this is listen to the experts. But, we also, but what we also need to remember about the experts is that they can be wrong because theories can be wrong. So experts are more valuable than just a person on the street. You, the, the experts are the most valuable. And he uses the case of, of medicine here. Okay? So even if a surgery didn't go entirely as planned, you still want an expert doctor performing your surgery than you do want some homeless guy with a scalpel on the side of the street. So even though that surgery can still go wrong, you want to trust the expert to the surgery not someone who doesn't know what they're doing or what they're talking about or who doesn't have the credentials. Also, pay attention to your experts. Just because they have a background in this doesn't mean that they're an expert on the field. This is where you get into doctors. Do you want a heart surgeon performing your brain surgery? So just because he has a medical degree doesn't mean that he fully understands all the elements of the brain. The last thing that we need to do is pause before sharing anything and always be willing to look into the story more. This is where you can also go back to the medical field and off the first Hippocr or the first oath, do no harm. So the information that we share has serious, serious consequences and effects in the world and how people perceive everything. And the information that we share, as Celeste Headley said in her 10 Ways to Have a Better Conversation, talk should not be cheap. The information that you share has consequences and it can affect the way that people think and perceive the world. So you need to make sure that your information is valuable and correct and well-rounded 
and has been tested and tried before you simply share. If you have any questions, um, here's some additional resources that you can check out if you want. Um, but if you, if you have any questions, just shoot me an email, let me know, and I would be more than happy to help.